Hello and welcome to Looking Through Luke, a YouTube series where we systematically work through one of the ancient biographies of Jesus known as the Gospel of Luke. My name is James and I'm so glad that you've found us. Uh, whether you're a skeptic, a curious onlooker, or indeed a follower of Jesus, my hope is that together uh, we would have a clearer view of who Jesus is, uh, the claims that he made and what he did, and that along the way we might even meet Jesus himself. Feel free to ask questions or comment below uh, as we learn together. I'm so glad that you're here, so let's jump into our next episode. Welcome to Looking Through Luke. So glad that you're with me. As we pick up the next section of Luke's biography of the life of Jesus, his gospel. Today, we are looking at Zachariah's response to the birth of his son, John. If you've been following with us, you know the backstory. Uh, Zachariah hasn't been able to speak. He's been uh, deaf and dumb because uh, he didn't trust, he didn't believe what the angel had told him concerning the birth of his child. And now the child's been born, a son, and Elizabeth has motioned that his name's to be John. The crowd were the crowd gathered around were, were a bit surprised by that. Surely his name's going to be Zechariah. And they've turned to Zechariah and said, what's his name? And Zechariah has responded as the angel commanded him, his name is John. And suddenly his hearing and his speech has returned and he begins to praise God. That's a miraculous moment. I wonder what your first response would be if you'd been unable to speak uh, for many, many months. Uh, when my second child was born, uh, I've shared a little bit earlier how perhaps I didn't respond so well to the news of the birth of my first child, uh, but when my second child was born, uh, I was there in the hospital and I had the great privilege of, of delivering this baby and the first words out of my mouth were, it's a beautiful girl. And that's something that, uh, that I, I can uh, be proud of. I'm very glad that that came out and not something like, ooh, what a mess, or something like that. It's a beautiful girl. That are my first words. Uh, maybe if you had a, uh, a child, if you've had a son or a daughter, I wonder what your first words were uh, when that child was born. Well, we get to see and hear Zachariah's first words. And it actually bursts out in a song. Now, whether he actually sang it, uh, I don't think so. I don't think, when I think of this and I think of a song, I think, you know, maybe Zachariah busted out something like Fiddle of fiddled on the roof and got into a musical and started singing. I don't, think it, I don't think it happened like that, but I've got no doubt that these words were formed uh, over the years into a, into a hymn. And in fact, uh, we now know it, uh, in particularly in classical music circles, as the Benedictus. And you can hear some sublime recordings, choral recordings of this, uh, this hymn of praise recorded to music. So I don't know if his first words were in fact sung, but they certainly were an outpouring of praise from his heart. Uh, when my kids were born, I didn't, I didn't write songs for them. Uh, when, I, when I was married, uh, I wrote a song for Karen. Uh, and the idea of writing a song for your uh, beloved as she walks down the aisle towards you, it's full of romantic pictures and, and uh, an incredible gesture. Uh, and let's be honest, uh, so often, in fact, almost always, it can turn into an incredibly cheesy and cringeworthy moment. Uh, and maybe it was for everybody else. But I remember uh, as Karen came down the aisle and I, as I uh, sang this song that I had written for her, my heart was full and overcome with emotion and joy uh, and even praise. And it spilled out uh, and spilled forth and, and others were there to witness it and no one paid attention to it because Karen was walking down the aisle. Uh, and, and for me, it's that kind of an idea, Zachariah's heart is overcome with an incredible moment. He knows how special this is. It's a miracle. And so he, he bursts forth that which is on his heart. And not only is it on his heart, we read that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. 
Which means that God's Spirit has, in this moment, worked in, in Zechariah's heart and mind and mouth so that what he speaks, he speaks with the, with, with the faithfulness and truthfulness and hope and promise of, of God speaking. So what is it that he said? Well, let's read it. Uh, it's called Zechariah's Song. It's in Luke chapter 1. His father, that's John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to his father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in the darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And that little passage finishes with a, a note from Luke to say that the child, that's John, grew and became strong in spirit and lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So that is the, the uh, hymn of praise, uh, the, the flow of words inspired by the Holy Spirit that come out of Zechariah in response to John's birth. And, and there's really two sections or two parts to this hymn of praise. The first uh, section is praise, and it's prophetic praise. That is, it's even praising God in the moment for what he has done, also praising God for what he will do as if it's already happened. And that's from verses 68 to 74. And then from verse 75 to 79, uh, it's, it's a prophecy regarding his son, John, and what John will do in his life. And indeed, uh, what the one who his son points to will do when he arrives. So we're going to unpack that a little bit. Uh, hopefully it won't take too long and it will really bring to life for us how Luke is, is showing Theophilus uh, and those who read this biography account how God has been all this time preparing uh, his people, uh, preparing Israel for this moment where the Messiah will come into the world and begin to uh, affect God's plan of redemption and salvation. So we read uh, in verse 68, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. That's the reason why he's coming. He's coming to redeem them, to rescue them, to deliver them, to free them. And in order to do that, uh, Zechariah prophesies or tells us that he, that is God, has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Now, I don't know about you, but a horn of salvation is not uh, a particularly common phrase uh, that we use today. Uh, I don't know when the last time you were talking with your friends, maybe about the latest game, maybe you're in line at McDonald's or something like that, and you said, oh, and by the way, da 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 Horn of salvation. It's not, a, it's not a common phrase, is it? Well, it actually references uh, a person. And a horn of salvation uh, ultimately points to a warrior king. Now, the phrase, the, the, a horn, comes from the picture of an ox with horns. You can imagine the kind of damage a charging bull with two horns might do to a, a person or a, a predator. Well, over time, that image then transferred to a warrior. Uh, it's not just in the, in the land of Vikings, but warriors would sometimes wear helmets affixed with, with horns as well. And in the heat of battle, that too could become a weapon. 
Uh, and so this image went from ox to, to helmets, to horns, to, to warriors. And so now we read that, uh, that God has raised up the horn of salvation. That is a warrior king who will save, redeem, rescue his people. And that warrior king will come from the house of David. Now, that might not mean much uh, to you, but, the, the, but David, King David, was uh, the prototypical king in Israel. He was the king by which all other kings were measured and fell short. Uh, David as king represents the high point as a, as a king who, who uh, leads and governs and rules his people in, in accordance to how God would have a king do that. David was by no means perfect. Uh, he, he had, there's, there's many sordid stories about David, but he has a, has a heart that longs to serve God and longs uh, to be just and good uh, towards his people. And God makes a covenant, an oath, a promise with David that out of David's descendants will come uh, one even greater than David, uh, will come uh, a, a, a perfect king who will rule with perfect justice uh, and establish everlasting peace. So he's raised up, says Zechariah. God has raised up a horn of salvation, a warrior king for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. Two things about that. Firstly, uh, God has been sending people over centuries to speak of what will happen. So although this event is surprising and it catches many off guard, uh, this, is, this is something that God has been pointing towards for hundreds of years. There have been people that God has sent, prophets who have been raised up to say, there is a Messiah coming. He'll be from the house of David. He'll be, he'll be born in the town of Bethlehem. But equally important is that little phrase, as he said don't know if you remember, if you've joined with us, that one of the things Luke wants to make sure Theophilus knows, which is why he spent so much time in this narrative leading up even to the birth of Jesus, is that God will do what he has said he will do. It's one of our big themes. God's promises can be trusted. He's good. He's sovereign. That is, he's in control. And he follows through. And so here again, just as he said, even though it was hundreds of years ago, he said it, and now it's happened. God does what he said. Well, what? Salvation from our enemies. Deliverance, rescue from the hand of all who hate us. Now this has both um, political uh, overtones and spiritual overtones. This points... Uh, to uh, a spiritual reality that, that there are spiritual forces that work against and hate God's people. But also we live in a, in a broken, messed up world where nations are at war against other nations uh, and, and right here in this prophecy we have a declaration one day of uh, world peace. Uh, we, we make, sometimes it's easy to make a mockery of the idea of world peace. Uh, think of that, you know, you think of Miss Universe competitions, etc. I think there was a movie uh, with Sandra Bullock in it once and, you know, everyone gets up, what do you want? World peace, world peace, world peace. And the reality that you and I see is that, that world peace, uh, particularly at this very moment as, as Russia has invaded Ukraine, it seems so far from us. But even 2,000 years ago, there was a, there was a declaration that with this coming Messiah, he will usher in peace. And we're going to explore later on uh, where we are in in that uh, particular point in time, uh, when that will happen. But right now, this prophecy is for salvation, rescue, deliverance, uh, physically, spiritually. Why? What will happen as, as God shows this salvation through his, the one he has sent, the Messiah, the, uh, 
horn of salvation, the warrior king, well, what will happen is he, God, in doing this, will show mercy to our ancestors. God's mercy is his loyal, faithful, gracious love as he acts for his people. And this is God's ultimate loving kindness, his ultimate act of faithful, gracious love uh, in, in the giving of uh, this Messiah, in the giving of Jesus. And he also does it to remember his holy covenant, to remember the oath that he's sworn. Why? Because God does what he says he will do. And, and says Zechariah, he will rescue us from the hand of our enemies and, and listen to this, enable us to serve him without fear. So Zechariah is prophesying about a future salvation that, that is that, that happens when the Messiah comes into the world, the warrior king will bring about this salvation, this deliverance, this freedom, this liberation, this rescue. And it will happen, says Zechariah, as he prophesies, as he speaks forth, forth tales under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it will happen to enable us to serve him, serve the king, serve God without fear. Now, the idea of serving doesn't fill many of us with excitement, uh, particularly when we think about it in regards to powerful people, maybe even in regards to God. You know, the picture sometimes we might have is us holding palm leaves, you know, as there's sun baking on the deck and we wave our palm leaves over them just to cool them down. That's the, that's the image we have of serving. And yet you and I, we serve all the time. We serve our uh, children, we serve our friends, we serve our spouses, we serve our parents. We give of ourselves for the good of others. Really, that's what is at the heart of serving. It's a loving, gracious giving of oneself to bless somebody else. Well, uh, we're saved, says Zechariah, through this prophecy, to serve. But it isn't just the idea of this activity of doing something. Actually, uh, this is much more connected with the idea of worshipping. See, we all give ourselves over to things, whether it's through serving people. Uh, some of us serve careers. Some of us serve our bank balances. Uh, some of us serve our agendas and, and ideologies of others. We're all... Uh, expending our lives in some way, serving different things. Uh, and serving is very closely connected to worship. And so what Zechariah has in mind is actually we, uh, a way in which we can serve, that we can worship this warrior king the way that in fact we've been designed, created to do. We can do it without fear. We can do it without encumbrance. Actually, uh, we'll discover as we go through Luke and we look at the story of Jesus, it's actually in the serving and worshipping of this warrior king, this Messiah, that we live our best lives, that we make best sense of the world, that we discover who we are and, and how we've been made and what we've been made for. It all comes together in the worshipping and the serving of this warrior king. That's the first section of the hymn of praise from Zechariah. The second section uh, is... Uh, a fourth telling, a, a speaking out of the future, particularly concerning his son and then the one to whom his son points. Listen what he says. You, my child, that's his son John, will be called a prophet of the Most High, a prophet of God. Why? Well, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. So John is going to go before the Messiah, the Horn of Salvation, and prepare the way. How will you do that? Well, this is how he'll do it in verse 77. To give his people, as the people of God, the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. So what, what Zechariah is saying is that this boy John is going to grow up to become a man and he's going to live his life in such a way as a prophet of God. He's going to have a message and a mission that will prepare people to hear and see and respond to the coming warrior king 
And the means by which that's going to happen is that this boy will grow up to a man who will call the people to repentance, call the people to acknowledge their need for forgiveness and show them that this forgiveness is possible. That the knowledge of salvation, that is the way to salvation, even now, Zechariah speaks out, will actually be through forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness. And that will ready them for the warrior king who comes. So what does Zechariah have to say of the coming Messiah? Well, he says, It is like the rising sun coming down from heaven, shining a light on those living in darkness, living in the shadow of death. Jesus' mission will be one of guiding the lost, those dwelling in darkness, those who are oppressed spiritually and physically, those who are sitting in the shadows of death. He will guide them into God's way. He will bring them out of darkness into light. Says Zechariah, as he finishes his song, he will guide our feet into the path of peace. That's a wonderful place to finish. He will guide our feet into the path of peace. What will the Messiah do? What will the one whom God sends to bring salvation, to bring redemption, deliverance, freedom, the horn of salvation, the warrior king, what will he do as he shines like a light into the darkness to bring people who are lost out of darkness into light? Well, this is what he'll do. He will guide our feet into the path of peace. Uh, The early uh, church father, uh, theologian, uh, St. Augustine, famously said, our hearts are not at rest until they find their rest in thee, in you, God. And as we live our lives, we struggle to know and hold on to that peace, don't we? Inner peace. Peace that transcends the turmoil and of circumstance. Peace that transcends the, the trouble of life, the ups and downs of life. Peace that transcends the gnawing existential questions that we have that we typically block out until perhaps we're lying down in bed and our heads are on our pillows. This one, the one who will come, will guide our feet into the path of peace. Guide us into that place of rest, true rest, soul rest. The kind of rest where your whole body, heart, mind, soul, it let out that incredible sigh, that sense of coming home. Uh, When I was younger, uh, I used to occasionally stay with my grandparents. My grandparents were very poor and they lived in a tiny uh, tin house. Uh, when, when When they passed away, the very first thing that happened was that house was bulldozed down. It wasn't considered fit for human dwelling. But that place was really special to me. Uh, As a young kid, I I had all kinds of nightmares and trouble sleeping and and I'd go to Nan's and they had this great big double bed uh, in the center of, in a room pretty much in the center of the house. And I have many, many memories as a kid of lying there in the darkness, listening to the rain as it fell onto the tin roof. And that being an incredible source of comfort and peace to me. And later in life, when I was in my 20s, mid-20s, I'd come back to Nan's place. And whenever I got there, I would feel this sense of relief, this sense of peace. This was a safe place for me. The peace that Zachariah is talking about here is a peace that transcends any human uh, experience like I've just described. It goes down to the very depths of our soul. And it comes out of salvation. It comes out of being reconnected to God. That's what it means ultimately, as we'll see, to be redeemed. Uh, So friends, thank you so much for joining me on this little journey uh, through this section of Luke as we keep looking through Luke. Uh, If you know 
who Jesus is and you know how the story goes, uh, then this should just build our anticipation for what's coming. If you're journeying through this for the first time, we've got these incredible truths to test. That's what uh, Luke's writing to Theophilus for, so he would know the certainty of what he believes. We don't yet know how it's going to unfold, but Luke's setting us up. Whatever comes with this person of Jesus, he is going to be a a horn of salvation, a, a warrior king. He's going to be someone that shines light into the darkness, that guides people into the way of God. He's going to be someone that ultimately brings peace. And that's exciting. That's worth sticking around to find out. Uh, and if you're someone who's wrestling with peace, maybe you're feeling really anxious, uh, maybe there's things happening in your life and, and you feel like you're continually being robbed of peace, whether you believe, whether you'd say, to your neighbor, your friend, your spouse, I believe in God or not, why don't you just ask God now for him to bring his peace into your heart, into this moment, and see what happens. Can't wait to see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Feel free to make a comment below. And if you did find the video helpful or interesting, please hit the thumbs up and give us a like and click the bell notification and subscribe. It really helps us get these videos out to a wider audience. Uh, we're not trying to build a massive following or channel. Uh, we are simply trying to communicate the truth of who Jesus is from the Bible. So if that's something that you can get behind, uh, we'd love your support by doing those two simple things. It really helps us out. Thank you and see you next time.